Joe Cox was shot and stabbed to death, a dramatic account in court. Jurors hear how her thoughts were for the safety of colleagues. Let him hurt me, not you, she said. The man accused of murder, Thomas Mayer, allegedly told police when arrested, it's me. Also tonight, travelling at more than three times the speed limit, the tram that crashed, killing seven people. Fast food for thought, Donald Trump's late night snack as he grapples with life at the top and. I can hear an ambulance. You can hear an ambulance, can you? You can see them. If you wave to the police and the policeman's going to come and help Susie. The four-year-old hero who saved her mum's life. This is the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. Good evening. The Old Bailey has been hearing the desperately grim details of the final moments of the Labour MP Joe Cox, who was shot and stabbed to death in the street. Mrs Cox's family wept as colleagues who were with the MP outlined what happened. One described how she tried to hit out at the attacker. Another, how Joe Cox thought only of the safety of others. Let him hurt me, not you were among her final words. Earlier, a police officer had told how the accused man, Thomas Mayer, held out his hands when he was arrested and said, it's me. Mayer denies murder. Paul Davis spent the day at the Old Bailey and reports now on the latest from the Joe Cox murder trial. As assistant and friend to the popular MP, Priscilla Aswat was close to Joe Cox in life and in her death. Joe Cox's parents and sister were in court today to hear a tearful account of how friends made desperate attempts to save her, then held her in her last moments. Ms Aswat had driven the MP to the constituency surgery where the killer was waiting. She told the court, in that instant our lives changed forever. The first thing I knew, Joe was lying on the floor and a man was standing over her with a knife. After the first attack, she said she shouted to the MP, Joe, you need to get up and run. Think of the children. When the attacker came back, Fazilla said, I swung my handbag at him several times. I then heard two shots and saw him stabbing Joe again. At the end, I heard him say, Britain first. This is for Britain. Another of Joe Cox's assistants, Sandra Major, said she and Fazilla Anwat tried desperately to fight off the attacker with their handbags. But as they did so, Joe Cox, lying on the ground, shouted, Go away, you two. Let him hurt me but don't let him hurt you. 77-year-old Bernard Carter Kenny was stabbed trying to protect the MP. He wasn't able to give evidence in person, but the jury heard a statement in which he said, I thought he was thumping her until I saw the knife. On his intervention, the pensioner said, I thought if I could get on his back, I could bring him down. At the last moment, he saw me and shoved the knife into me. Blood was pouring through my fingers and I staggered back. Thomas Mayer is accused of murdering Joe Cox and attempting to murder Bernard Carter Kenny. The two officers who detained Mayer in Burstall shortly after the attacks, PCs Jonathan Wright and Chris Nichols, have described the arrest. PC Nichols said as they approached the suspect, he put his arms out and said, it's me. The officer shouted, where's the gun? Mayer is said to have replied, it's in the bag. After he was handcuffed, Thomas Mayer is said to have told the officers, I am a political activist. The jury saw video filmed just after the arrest, with Mayer handcuffed and restrained in the road. A firearms specialist said he found a sawn-off 2 rifle in Mayer's holdall. There was a round in the chamber and two more in a magazine, he said. It was ready to be used again. So, Paul, very clearly a difficult day in court. Well evidence there that was so hard to give and for the family so hard to hear. I mean, throughout Fasilla, as what was fighting through tears as she was describing Joe Cox's last moments, holding her during her last moments. And when that other assistant, Wendy Major, um, was talking and saying how she saw Joe Cox shot at point blank range, the head of Joe Cox's mother, Jean, went down. In fact, just about the only person showing no emotion at all in court today was the man in the dock, Thomas Mayer, who continues to plead not guilty to murder.
All right, Paul, thank you very much. Official confirmation came today that the tram which crashed in South London, killing seven people, was travelling too fast. An interim report says the tram was doing nearly 44 miles per hour at the bend where it derailed, and that's more than three times the speed limit. But as Richard Pallow reports from Croydon, there's no indication yet as to why. Engineers have all day been testing whether it's safe to reopen this line, but investigations have shown there was nothing wrong with the track or the tram, simply the dangerous speed it was being driven at. Seven people died in last week's crash. Initial analysis says some braking was applied approaching the bend, but that it was still going three and a half times quicker than permitted. This curve in the track has a 12 and a half mile an hour speed limit. According to the report, the two carriages were traveling at 43 and a half miles an hour. There were also no problems found with the tram's braking system or any track defects. Our ongoing investigation will look very closely at the factors affected the driving of the tram. So we'll be analyzing that in great detail. It's much too early at this stage, it'd be wrong to speculate. However, it will be a key part of our investigation to understand the factors that influence the driver's uh, performance as he approached the corner. Philip Logan was one of those killed, a great-grandfather on his way to work. He said goodbye to his wife Marilyn just minutes before, and she told me six days on of her reaction to the findings. Very angry, very, very angry. I mean, he wasn't only my husband, he was my friend and he was my soulmate, and we did everything together. And when you see the report says three and a half times the speed, mm. it should have been going. Yeah. It's disgusting. Urgent safety advice has been issued to all drivers who operate on this stretch of track, with investigators still looking into reports that excessive speed had been reported several times on this bend by commuters prior to the accident. The next stop will be the 42-year-old driver remains on police bail. Whether he blacked out or fell asleep are still active lines of inquiry. At the time of the accident, it was dark and raining heavily, and the CCTV aboard the tram was not working. Despite the immediacy of this initial report, it will be some time yet before the families get the full explanation into what happened. So, Richard, what do today's revelations mean for the investigation into the crash? Well, the rail accident investigation uh, branch who put out today's findings certainly seem to be pointing towards speed. And now they'll be now looking at why in particular it was traveling at 43 and a half uh, miles an hour. Do trains often go around this corner at that speed? And, and, and as has been suggested by several commuters that it happened several times before, if management knew about all of this, why on earth did they not act on it before? And could this accident have been prevented? OK, Richard Palo and Croydon, thank you. Now, Donald Trump has been forced to deny that the process of picking his first White House team is in chaos. Critics claim his messages on social media saying that he knows who the finalists are smacks too much of reality TV. And the president-elect also raised a few eyebrows by <clears throat> slipping off for a meal at his favourite steak bar. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore has the latest. Sir, are you making good progress in the transition? Hi, Josh. Great progress. Great progress. The vice president-elect is leading the team, but great progress is perhaps a charitable description. Inside Trump Tower in Manhattan, advisers and would-be cabinet members are coming and going, amid key staff being sacked and reports of bitter personal feuds. Last night, Donald Trump left his penthouse for a meal, but with the media not notified, the president-elect was filmed only by fellow diners as he entered the restaurant. Good meal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, Mr. President-elect. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get your taxes down. Thank, Thank you. you. So far, Trump has made just two appointments. One puts a radical right-wing figure, who some accuse of white nationalism, close to the Oval Office. As if this was a version of The Apprentice, the president-elect tweeted out this. Very organized process taking place as I decide on cabinet and many other positions, adding, I'm the only one who knows who the finalists are. One former Republican Party chairman says Trump is already in dangerous territory. The personal vendettas should be set aside because a lot of things are going to come fast and furious uh, at this administration at 1201. So 
uh, it, it's kind of one of those things you need to get in, get in front of. The transition has been called a knife fight, as those who thought defeat was certain suddenly find themselves jostling for power and position. The shape of the future Trump White House, who exercises the most power, who does the president listen to the most, is still almost entirely unclear. But the influence of one man, a billionaire but just 35 years old, is likely to be immense. Jared Kushner is Trump's son-in-law, married to his daughter Ivanka. Jared is a very successful real estate person, but I actually think he likes politics more than he likes real estate. There are reports that Jared Kushner is being cleared even to attend top secret presidential daily briefings, a sign of his likely pivotal role. For some, this is a toxic presidency before it's even begun. The Trump brand and name being removed from this building in New York at the request of residents. Robert Moore, ITV News, Washington. Now, there's been lots of uh, speculation about the potential cost of Brexit, but in one respect, at least, it became a little clearer today. The EU unveiled plans to charge foreign tourists who don't need visas five euros for an online security check. Let's go to Carl Dinan, our political correspondent. Carl, uh, give us a bit more on this. What does it mean specifically, do you think, post-Brexit? Well, what it could mean is that British travellers who want to go to the EU might have to fill out a form for uh, about 10 minutes online, pay five euros, just over four quid at the moment, uh, and that would give them visa-free access to the EU for five years. Now, this is a proposal at the moment being set up by the EU Commission for the kind of visa waiver scheme we currently have with, for example, the United States. But it is clear that although Britain's uh, relationship with the EU has yet to be negotiated, of course, uh, that this could apply to us. Uh, that's what the European Migration Commissioner said today. As far as the implementation of these new proposals is concerned, when the moment comes, uh, and if the United Kingdom is not anymore a member of the European Union, sorry to say, but it has to be treated as a third country on this issue. Now, that's not actually something that the British government might be opposed to. And, in fact, Britain's commissioner has been involved in uh, drawing up this proposal. Uh, because the idea, in fact, the reason the Europeans want to bring it in in the first place is that it would allow travellers into the EU and Britain, if we have a, a reciprocal arrangement, to be screened before we get here. And that, for security reasons, is something that the Home Office might find very attractive. All right, we'll see what happens. Carl, thanks very much indeed. Now, five police officers are to be investigated by the Independent Police Complaints Commission over possible failures in Scotland Yard's inquiry into claims of a VIP paedophile ring. Operation Midland carried out raids on high-profile suspects, including the former Home Secretary, Lord Britton, who was only cleared of an allegation after his death. The investigation has been widely criticised after ending without a single arrest. A family's fight to get justice for their son, who died after being tasered by police, took an extraordinary twist today. Yes, the police complaints watchdog went to the High Court to try to overturn their own report, clearing officers of wrongdoing over the death of Jordan Begley. Rebecca Barry has the story. Described by his family as hard-working and determined. But at 23, Jordan Begley died after he was tasered and restrained by police at his home in Manchester. Three years on, his mother is at the High Court fighting for justice. So all I want is a sorry. I want a sorry from someone that they shouldn't have walked into my house. They shouldn't have took my son away at the age of 23 years of age. I've got no grandchildren from him. You know, and I've got nothing left from him. At first, the Independent Police Complaints Commission cleared the police officers of any blame. But now it's seeking permission to overturn its own decision. This is unprecedented. The first time the police watchdog has asked for one of its own reports to be quashed. And for that to happen, there needs to be a judicial review. The U-turn comes after an inquest into Mr Begley's death found that the use of the taser was not reasonable and that the actions of the police officers contributed to his death. And it has me to police it as quick well, as I can, get please. Well, I'll as soon as we've got Jordan, one. just stay there. You're not going out. It was Jordan's mother who called the police, worried a row with a neighbour could get violent. You want to go out with a nurse, so you need to get to quick. Now she has to live knowing that phone call 
led to her son's death. If you're in trouble, you should be able to pick that phone up and dial for the police. I never expected my son to be dead. I never expected to be here today in London fighting for, you know, for justice for him. I need closure to it all. I need time to grieve. I've not been able to sit down once and grieve over my son. I've cried over him, but not, I've not grieved over him. Jordan's family might get that time to grieve if the judges decide to quash the original report, making room for a fresh, independent inquiry. Rebecca Barry, ITV News. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, calls for tougher fines for fly tippers as you share your experiences. And the four-year-old girl who saved her mum's life by dialing 999. We're just immensely proud of how intelligent and resilient she was and how brilliantly she did. But first, the government's coming under mounting pressure to pour more cash into social care in England. Councils and charities say the system is at breaking point and needs a major funding boost in uh, next week's autumn statement. It's claimed fewer people than ever are getting the social care they need because of council budget cuts. Uh, take Liverpool, for instance. 20,000 people received social care in 2010, but this year the number's down to below 16,000, and by 2018 it's estimated just 10,000 people will get social care. This, despite the fact that over the past six years, 15% more people are being sent for social care assessment. Our health editor Rachel Younger reports from Liverpool. I'm just chasing up a care package that you've had since the 10th of November. As a social worker, Eileen's job used to be a matter of working out what care the elderly needed. These days, she also has to fight tooth and nail for it. The gentleman's absolutely desperate to go home and he's, he's talking about refusing to eat and drink now because he's so down um, and wants to go home as soon as possible. Trapped in the middle is Bill. At 16, he was a merchant seaman, taking ammunition to the Normandy landings. But at 91, he's stuck, ready to go home, but with no care in place. It gets me down. <laughs> I've asked for the social worker to come up. And I'm just disappointed myself. I'd like to go today instead of the mother. <laughs> The residential hub where Bill's been rehabilitated is designed to relieve pressure on hospital beds. Right hand, right knee, left shoulder. But the system can't cope. September saw a record number of delayed discharges, meaning the NHS is now consistently missing targets as it struggles to free up beds. In Bill's home city, like everywhere else, it's the council that funds social care. But unlike the health service, that budget isn't ring-fenced. I've come to see the city's mayor to find out how he plans to deal with another £90 million in cuts. We're going to have to be harsher and tougher in our assessments and reduce people getting those care packages. And so as a consequence of that, people will struggle, people will suffer, people won't get the care they need, people will end up falling in their own homes, being put into hospital, and as a consequence, there'll be more pressures put on the NHS nationally and driving up costs. So that's why I said it's, it's not, you know, it's the economics of the madhouse. The sobering reality is that Bill is one of the lucky ones because unless new money is found next week, more and more people will be denied the care they need. Rachel Younger, ITV News, Liverpool. Three men have been jailed for life for murdering a teenager in Liverpool after he was mistaken for a rival gang member. Lewis Dunn was walking along a canal towpath when he was shot in the back with a shotgun. The men, all in their 20s, were looking for revenge when they wrongly identified the 16-year-old by his curly hair. The number of unemployed people in the UK has fallen to a 10-year low, down to 1.6 million. But the Office for National Statistics has warned that the growth in employment is slowing. And the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, Bob Dylan, is to snub the award ceremony in Sweden. In a letter to the committee, the 75-year-old singer said he had, quote, other commitments. Now, if you were watching yesterday, you might remember our report about the spreading blight of fly tipping. Well, it provoked a big response from those of you describing how illegally dumped rubbish is disfiguring your streets, parks 
and fields. And today, the Keep Britain Tidy Group is calling for bigger fines for fly tippers, many of whom it claims are commercial businesses. Well, our consumer editor, Chris Choi, is here. And you had a bit of a reaction, didn't you? Absolutely. Not just a big response, a furious response. People are livid about this affecting their lives, affecting their neighbourhoods. Have a look at some of the response that we got. This, first of all, from Darren Marsden in Trafford, Greater Manchester. A great big pile. There you see, look. Carpet, hardboard. Somewhere down in the corner there on the left, you see a shoe even. He's actually got a list of local grot spots. He says it can take um, 20 days for this kind of stuff to be removed, even after it's reported. Next, this is from Laura Jacks in Essex. Look at this great big pile. 10 or 15 feet of builder's rubble. Now, just imagine that. Anywhere in your neighbourhood would be awful. But that that you're seeing there is right outside a cemetery, virtually blocking the entrance. And how about this? A video from Javed Iqbal in Birmingham. He's actually at the end of his tether. He and a group of residents, go, they go round, they, they identify stuff like this, and then they themselves remove it. He and a lot of other people that have responded have the same question. Why can't the fines be stiffer and today the Keep Britain Tidy Group joined those calls. Some of the things that we've seen fly tip like like animal carcasses, um, dangerous chemicals, huge amounts of de debris that you know clearly commercial, um, that has to be met we think by much greater fines. All right, so that's what ordinary people like you and me think. What about the government and what about local councils? Well, it's, it gets to be a bit of a game of pass the parcel because central government sees this pretty much as a job for local government. In its turn, the, the councils, they're saying, shouldn't there be a larger responsibility for the product manufacturers, people, for example, that make mattresses? But they all agree change is necessary, including legal changes. Now, we're going to be right on top of this and we're going to continue our coverage. We'd like more stories, more pictures, more videos, and you can send them via our website. You see the details there. Thank you, Chris. And straight after this programme, Chris would really like to hear your experiences of fly tipping on our Facebook page. Do share your stories, please. Find out what can be done at facebook.com slash ITV News. Wayne Rooney has apologised unreservedly to England's interim manager, Gareth Southgate, after photographs emerged of him on a night out. The pictures, published by a newspaper, showed the England captain attending a party at a hotel after Friday's game against Scotland. Rooney said the photos, apparently taken in the early hours, are inappropriate for someone in his position. And finally, the quavering little voice talking to an emergency call handler belonged to a four-year-old girl, but there was absolutely nothing uncertain about what Susie McCash did. And she dialed 999 and then calmly explained what was happening to her mum. Emergency services say Susie's actions probably saved her mother, who had suffered a severe allergic reaction. Peter Smith went to meet the little heroine in North Tyneside. Wow! Susie McCash is only four, but there was a hero's welcome for her at this ambulance depot today. I was blown away by how very good you were. When I got the paramedics here saved Susie's mum's life, but they could not have done it without this quick-thinking little girl. Incredibly grateful. You know, we, we know she's bright, but we were so surprised listening to the call. Everyone says she sounds calm. To us, she sounds really nervous <laughs> um, because she was quiet, one-word answers, but she gave them all the information they needed um, to help me. When Susie's mum, Rowena, went into anaphylactic shock, she knew exactly what to do. Well, I called 999, so they came. Mummy had an answer yet because she just... I don't know why, but she had an answer yet. What's your mummy doing now? Um, she's just sitting on the sofa and, and doing nothing. And before when we were out, she was just busy, and now she feels really poorly. She's feeling poorly. How old are you, Susie? Four. You're four years old. You're doing really well. Well done. Can you yeah. open the door? Can you be a big girl? Because people's going to be coming along to the address to see Mummy. Well, I can't really reach the lock, but I'll have a go. <laughs> Ambulance crews were now on their way. The door's open now, is it, Susie? Yeah. What are you going to do, Susie? I just need to knock on my door when I come in. I just want to check through this window. You don't think he's in, do you not? I can hear an ambulance. You can hear an ambulance, can you? You can see them. If you wave to the police and the policeman's going to come and help Susie. 
Give wave to them. Give wave to them. Are they coming now, are they? Yeah. Adam Hall was the voice talking to Susie on the other end of the line. When the officer arrived, uh, she wasn't breathing. Uh, I don't know if you heard the call. Um, I think she tried to put her mother on the line, but she wasn't able to speak at all. Um, without a doubt, the little girl saved her mother's life. Susie sent him a box of chocolates as thanks. Today, he got to meet her. The paramedics then had a gift of their own to give. Certificate of commendation to Susie McCash, and that's have been absolutely awesome. Susie says it will now take pride of place on her bedroom wall. But evidently, she didn't do it for the awards. Peter Smith, ITV News, Tynemouth. Susie, you're a star. I can't speak. You've been in tears all <laughs> afternoon, aren't you still? Oh, I can't bear it. Oh dear. Right, we better go. That's it. Tom Bradby will be here with the late news. That's at 10.30 tonight. And from all of us here, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>